Did the United States support the Martial Law Administration under Ferdinand Marcos? And if yes, how so? What exactly did they do that can be described as propping up this authoritarian dictatorship here in the Philippines? And what can we learn specifically from chapters 13 and 14 of The Conjugal Dictatorship by Primitivo Mijares? I have been reading this book on and off over the past few weeks, and I've been learning a lot about the inner workings of the Marcos administration. And these two chapters specifically focus on like the, the trail of money of sorts, from the American side to the Marcos side. And I learned a lot, so I'm excited to kind of go into it. But I think in order to better understand and appreciate this stuff, it's important to lay out first the groundwork of Philippine-American history over the past 120 years. Because a lot of this stuff helps us understand what was going on in these chapters, as well as how our relationship has continued to develop since then. The United States officially colonized the Philippines in 1898, and it lasted from 1898 to 1946, where in 46 they you know, gave us independence. Throughout the years from 1898 to 1946, the, I guess, rhetorically, or the goal that the United States was saying that they were doing in the Philippines was to help establish a government that can be able to eventually be self-sufficient or sustain themselves. There was a sense that, you know, early on in the American colonization, I guess, trajectory, the locals were these savages, you know, the savages that were the, they were um, the white man's burden. And so the United States needed to help build up the political, I guess, capabilities of the locals so that they can eventually be able to control themselves and they can be free. And it was supposed to be this thing that they were doing out of the bottom of their hearts or whatever. And so for several decades, this is what they were saying they were doing here. Now, as early as the 1910s, there were already movements that, and description and people kind of in the political sphere that wanted the Philippines to be independent. And so there was an agreement that eventually the country would be independent as early as the 1910s, especially during the Filipinization stage in the mid 1910s that had more Filipinos join the government. There's really this kind of sense that eventually we will transition into full independence. All of this, the process of this stuff ended up getting interrupted by the Second World War. We are in specifically in Asia, the Japanese uh, took over many of the countries that were previously colonized by Western powers, you know, like the Philippines and Malaysia and Singapore and you know, all of these other countries. And so there, there was this transition of government from previous Western colonizers to the Japanese colonizers. Now, what's interesting about Japanese colonization was that it was running on this very nationalistic point of view, where the, from each country that they would go into, they wanted to help stoke, you know, they wanted to stoke, I guess, anger against the previous colonizers. And so part of what they did was they allowed nationalism to flourish, meaning that, for example, in the Philippines, Filipino or Tagalog was allowed to be the national language for the very first time under the Japanese. And so in every country, they would kind of get a bunch of nationalist uh, politicians and nationalist you know, figures to help rule the country. Around the same time, there were so the thing is, the Japanese were examples of what they call the fascist ideology. They were like expressing fascist ideologies uh, that was cloaked in the sense of pan Asianism, where there's Asian solidarity as opposed to Western. Anti Westernism was very closely tied to Asian solidarity, where everyone will be one as one Asia, uh, maybe under the tutelage of the Japanese or something. But there was a sense again that part of the way that they were administrating their control of the country was propping up nationalism. So during so people who were on the side of the Japanese were already people who to some degree felt that they wanted to control the country or wanted to be have kind of they wanted to have independence for themselves where they would be able to have power over the previous, you know, colonizers. In the same way, on the other side of the political divide, you have the people who are on the left, maybe the communist people closely more closely and the communists, where they were not thinking nationally nationally as much as internationally. Um, in theory, but in practice, even the people on the left were also nationalists in a different way, where they felt that they can't be aligned with this Japanese government because that is still imperialism, or that's still being controlled by a foreign colonizing body. And so the Japanese were also colonized just as the Westerners were. And so the people on the left were very anti-Japanese as well, while the people on the right uh, were anti-West. So after the war ended, you know, it was very confusing because what Japan, then, you know, as everyone knows, Japan lost the war after the atom bombs. And so they left each of these countries they colonized and left behind a very fractured society in Asia specifically, where people on the right 
you know, had some kind of semblance of control, or at least a feeling of control or position of control. People on the left wanted a change in society where they were not colonized anymore. And suddenly they were returned back to pre-war status where each of these countries were now back to the Western, back under Western powers. So there seems to be like an ideological coalition of sorts against the Western powers in many of these countries where people on the right and left both wanted independence in their own ways, but at least they wanted to unite to have kind of this anti-imperialist, anti-colonizer, anti-West kind of struggle for independence. So in countries like Malaysia and all these other places around us, they have these moments of you know, fights for independence in Vietnam, uh, very famously. In the Philippines, that was not the case. In the Philippines, we didn't fight for independence. Uh, the United States uh, just kind of agreed with what they previously said they would do. And they allowed us to be, or they, on paper, allowed us to be independent in 1946 under, Mar under Manuel Rojas. Now, one of the most controversial aspects of the presidency of Manuel Rojas as the kind of president after this whole you know, war was that he signed this thing called the Philippine Trade Act that exchanged American aid for the rehabilitation of the Philippines after the war. Because for those who remember, Manila was one of the most destroyed cities in the entirety of the planet during the Second World War. There were a lot of funds and there were a lot of money that needed to be used to help reconstruct the country because of the war. Again, that, that happened because the United States were here. And, you know, it, and to some degree, it's the reason, the reason why we were destroyed and bombed by the Japanese and the United States was because they were having war in our country. Uh, but for some reason, you know, for some reason, in order to get aid to help rehabilitate the country that was started by them, the war that was started by them, we needed to exchange something. So what was exchanged for rehabilitation money? It was the ability for for the Americans to exploit resources from of the Philippines as if they were also Filipinos. Because there was this thing where, only uh, like a law of sorts, where only Filipinos are allowed to exploit the resources of the country, meaning like oil and stuff like that. With the, because of this Philippine Trade Act, Americans now were now kind of equals to Filipinos in terms of this right, and so they had the ability to come into the country and maybe put lots of money, buy these like resources, or uh, develop these maybe bigger companies that can kind of extract uh, stuff from the country. Uh, and so, af so after nineteen forty six, when this Philippine Trade Act was finally implemented, more and more American foreign, um, I guess, money was coming into the country. And there was a growing sense that even though we were po technically, politically separate from the United States, because of this new influx of American money and American infrastructure, it didn't seem like we were economically free from the United States. At least this was the perspective of many people from the left during this period of time. One of the ways in which this was exemplified in, in mass action was what happened with the Hukba Lahap. So the Hukba Lahap was this organization uh, that was led by the um, members that were part of the PKP or the Partido Comunista ng Pilipinas or communist group uh, that were not, they were not, the Hukbal Hap was not necessarily ideologically very strong, like, but what they wanted was an ability to have control over land, of their own land, and to have more redistribution. They wanted to kind of expel the United States from all this control that they were kind of growing to continue to accumulate over time. And so uh, the United States, um, in coordination with the Magsaysay government, for example, and the CIA worked out to get rid of the Hukba Lahap. And, you know, you can, look all, you can look up Edward Lansdale and all this stuff. And so even though the United States was technically not politically ruling the country, they still had lots, had lots of political influence because of the way in which they had so much. We, because we were so economically aligned with the U.S., the U.S. had a lot of control over our politics because they can, like, threaten aid, you know, removing or, you know, adding aid and all this stuff. So there was a sense that there was a growing, um, a growing sense that the Philippines was never independent. So one by one, these other countries around us were slowly, slowly getting their independence. You know, wars of independence happened and they were slowly getting independence. But the Philippines, while we were independent on paper, many people felt we were not economically independent. And so there, there was a growing anti-American sentiment throughout the 1960s, especially, which can be exemplified, for example, with in 1968, there was the, the Communist Party of the Philippines under Jose Maria Sison was formed for the first time and other different leftist organizations were slowly trying to describe the Marcos administration at the time as being too pro-American. In reality, I think 
leading up to that point, every president was extremely pro-American. But I think 19, the 1960s was just a time when things felt out of hand because of the growing sentiment of a growing realization of just how much control the United States was having around the world. This was during the Vietnam War, where the Filipinos were se- where Philippines were sending Filipinos there for war, just as we did in, during the Korean War in the early fifties, and so. There's a sense that we're just giving too much to the United States, and they're, we're not getting enough of things of things back. And there's an unequal relationship between the two countries. During all this time, there was the Cold War as well, uh, and so during the Cold War, America was ideologically um, in war with the Soviet Union. And before I don't want to go into all of this because it can be a bit too complicated. But the point of this was that there was a there was a at the same time as anti-American sentiment was growing in the Philippines, it was more closely getting tied up with pro-Soviet Union sentiment, or getting tied up with pro-Chinese sentiment later on with the Communist Party of China. And all this stuff leads up to 1972, where Marcos, you know, puts in martial law. Now, what does this have to do with Philippine-American, I guess, administration? The, the, the chapters are interesting. So chapter 14 describes a, w- a way to understand the martial law's implementation as perhaps also being about improving the investment climate of the Philippines. So because of the growing anti-Americanism, American business owners felt like th- we were becoming more unstable and their investments were being threatened by the growing anti-American sentiment, both by politicians, by historians, by the growing public. And so martial law, in a way, according to the chapter, was done so that American businessmen will feel more safe with their investments in the country. So it's a combination of being done in order to help the American investors or to kind of increase investment in the Philippines, as well as to, to kind of invite more of them to come here so that we can be more closely aligned with the U.S. Now, why is, is that, what does this have to do with the United States supporting the, the country's martial law administration? Because of the increase of the kind of like the martial, the kind of having martial law instituted so that there will be lessening of dissent, lessening of anti American sentiment, people who are expressing anti Marcos sentiment, again, were very closely tied with expressing anti American sentiment. And all, most of them were all jailed. And so the people who were threatening the US business interests were now being off the map. And now, we're, now the society that the country was in had a better investment climate. And so in America, Amer- many American businesses, according to the book, we're also, you know, rallying for martial law to continue to be implemented because they were benefiting from it. Who else is benefiting benefiting from it? Um, the United States government also was, was able to have these, you know, the basis here as well. So they were benefiting it by allowing the basis to continue to run, operate, you know, and send different, you know, the kind of the United the Philippines became like a base for U.S. operations in the region during the Cold War, and so the U.S. was getting something good from that, um, and. What they were doing a lot of the time was under the pretense of wanting to stop communism in the country and stopping all this, you know, uh, unrest in order to increase, you know, investment confidence and to increase stability in the country. The United States was ostensibly giving a lot of aid to the country, military aid, in order to help them with their, in order to help the country, help the Marcos administration, you know, fight the communists. But what was really happening was that the money given from the United States to the Marcos administration was being used to help prop up the Marcos administration itself, meaning the money goes not to the anti-insurgency movements, but to the Presidential Security Command under Fabian Ver, where a lot of the money uh, was used to destroy Marcos's political enemies. And so the book goes, the chapters 13 and 14 go one by one to all these different ways in which the money given to different aid, you know, on paper, it was meant to give aid to the country, military support, but all of it ended up kind of being redirected back to helping Marcos maintain his power by destroying his political rivals. And none of the money actually ends up going to actually helping the communities. And so on paper, the United States was helping the Philippines in all sorts of ways, but really the money was just being redirected, misappropriated in order to help Marcos maintain his power and strength. And the ones who were benefiting most from all of this stuff, again, was the U.S., was Marcos, was the U.S. multinational corporations that were continuing to put money in the country and economically, you know, becoming more successful to the expense of the local Filipinos who had no idea what was going on and had no control over any of this stuff. Uh, This is what the chapters are about. And I think it's very interesting to look at it in that perspective where the United States ended up supporting 
economically the Marcus administration and in a, in a ways that were very um, very intense.